The Amiga from Commodore is one of the most versatile computers currently available with applications far beyond a mere games machine, right up to professional standard in graphics, image processing, desktop publishing and video. In this video, we give you a glimpse of some of the applications, software and hardware in most common use. You'll see that the Amiga is a versatile and powerful tool, with uses limited only by your own imagination. Richard Lockton, a full-time professional Amiga user in graphics, desktop publishing and video, is going to talk us through the different sections which feature live screenshots of the programs actually running on an Amiga. First of all, let's take a quick look at a clip from our Space Wars video by Tobias Richter to see a meager animation at its best. Amos, the creator, is nothing like you've ever seen before on the Amiga. Developed from the best-selling STOS game creation tool for the Atari ST, Amos stretches the Amiga to its limits. Whatever your knowledge of programming, Amos has something to offer you. In this brief glimpse at the program, you will see the ability to produce professional-looking games with just a fraction of the normal effort. All you need is a little imagination. Amos can be run either from floppy or hard disk and has a comprehensive manual to guide you through the hundreds of commands which are required to write sophisticated games. This eerie castle is part of a short demo game included with the Amos program. It shows how screens can be made to scroll with ease. Titles added, even music and sound effects too. All you are seeing and hearing now is from the Amos program you saw loaded in the editor window. Graphics and pictures like these can be created in paint programs and then imported into Amos. The game is played by choosing options with the mouse from a series displayed. Information about the progress of the game is given and the direction in which you want to travel can be chosen. This brings up the next screen. Clicking the mouse again gives us more information about continuing the game. And once again, we can choose the direction in which we want to travel. Information about our progress is updated in the left-hand panel.
The red bar, which has now appeared at the bottom of the screen, shows that I have interrupted the program via the keyboard. The line at which the program was halted is shown, and a couple more key presses brings us back to the editor. Now we'll load another program. Choose the correct file from the requester. And select load. We can take a look at how the program is put together and then run it. This is a number leap game which is fun to play. Once again the sound effects and voices are all part of the program. This game features independently animated sprites or picture elements which change their positions continually. The frog is controlled by the player at the keyboard. And moves to reach the other side of the fun. That's not bad. Keep trying. Whoops, I forgot. If a mistake is made, the frog, the frog sinks not and you lose. Now let's change the multiplication table we are working with for the purpose of this game. Getting the idea? I'll interrupt the program and go back to the editor. Now we'll take a look at one of the ways that sprites can be created in Amos using the sprite editor. The program is first loaded into the editor window. A full listing of the program appears and can be examined. You can of course do this with the programs you write yourself. When the program runs, a paint package type toolbox appears. The various tools can be selected. Interestingly, each tool has its own musical note accompaniment. Let's create a sprite. First select the line tool and the color red from the palette. The large window on the left allows us to see the sprite at a large size whilst the right-hand window gives us an idea of what the actual size representation looks like. We draw in the red line. There's the small representation. And here's the enlarged version. We'll pick a new color and draw in another line. Now we'll change the tool to a filled rectangle. Select a new colour and draw our rectangle on the screen. Now we'll add some text. Change colour again. The text is entered at the keyboard.
Before the text is stamped down by using the mouse, it can be positioned accurately. And the same with the second line. Here's the sprite as we've created it. We create the sprite editor program and return to the editor window. Had we been working on an actual project, once the sprite had been created to our satisfaction, we could have named and saved it for use in a game. It's also possible to view sprites via the sprite grabber program, seen briefly here. Break the program again and back to the editor. The AMOS program comes complete with many examples for you to try during the learning process. The beauty of it is that you can see the listings for each element of the project and edit and amend it at will. Here a group of four arrowheads is loaded from the AMOS disk and can be manipulated via the mouse. It is also possible to import picture files and graphics, sound samples plus much, much more. With Amos, it is literally possible to unleash your imagination. The interface used by the Amiga is called the Workbench. Think of it as a workspace for all of your in-progress projects. The Workbench will allow you to view the contents of any disk, organize your programs and data, prepare new disks for data or format them, copy files from one disk to another, access programs and utilities. into the actual operations of the computer, we should explain one more function of the workbench and the Amiga. Because the Amiga is a graphical computer, there is a lot of emphasis on the screen and anything that's displayed on it. Screens are made up of several important attributes, including the resolution, referring to the number of pixels or little dots the computer can display either vertically or horizontally at once. Depending on the resolution selected, the number of usable colors will change as well. There are a variety of modes available, from 16 to 32 colors, all the way up to 4,096 colors in a specialized display mode called Hold and Modify, or HAM. Because the Amiga is graphics and video oriented, the computer will also support a video mode called Interlace. This mode doubles the number of horizontal display lines and displays half of them at a time, cycling the lines at a 30th of a second. This is the same method used by television. Now's a good time to explain some of the visual aids provided by the interactive workbench environment. Now that the workbench is loaded, you'll notice that in addition to the icons on the screen, there is an object that looks like a little arrow. This is called the mouse pointer. As you move the mouse of your Amiga, this little object will move around the screen. The mouse pointer is very powerful, as it will allow you to execute various commands without typing on the Amiga keyboard. The tip of the pointer is the actuating area of the pointer. And when you are using the pointer, make sure the tip is on top of anything that you want to use or select. The workbench screen includes several different types of objects. These include a bar across the top of the screen. Depending on its function, it's referred to as a menu bar, drag bar, or title bar. In every case, 
the bar will provide information to you, in addition to supporting a multiple menu system for making operational decisions and positioning the screen. More on this later. Next, there are icons. An icon is a graphical representation of either a disk, a program, a data file, or a drawer. Drawers are unique to the Amiga Workbench. They function in the same manner as the drawers of a filing cabinet. You can separate your programs or data into separate compartments. This will make keeping track of your work easy. A window represents a partition of information. For example, if you wanted to see what is on a disk, you will see a window of the information on a disk. If you wanted to open a drawer of data, the contents of the drawer will be displayed in a window. The window can provide some valuable information to you. For example, notice the colored gauge on the left side of the window. It's called a memory meter. It's kind of like a gas gauge in your car. It shows you how much room is left on the disk you're displaying. There are some other controls on the window called gadgets. We'll discuss them a bit later on. Let's take a brief look at the different types of icons available to you. First of all, there is the disk icon. This represents any disks that are loaded into the Amiga's disk drives. A disk icon could also represent a hard disk or a RAM disk. If we position the mouse on top of the disk icon and click the mouse once, it'll change color. This means the icon has been selected and it's now ready to be accessed. There are a number of ways you could do this. For now, let's click the mouse twice quickly and the disk will open up and display the window of contents on the Amiga screen. There are four types of icons now visible. The first ones to consider are the drawer icons. These look like drawers in a dresser and contain programs, data, or even other drawers of information. For example, there is a drawer with the Amiga operating system, a drawer with the Amiga utilities, another with demonstration programs, and an empty drawer, just waiting for you to put something in it. The other icons are also important. These include the trash can icon, the preferences icon, and the clock icon. If you want to erase something from the disk or from the computer's memory, you place the file or program in the trash. This is a perfect example of the interactive nature of the workbench. The preferences icon allows you to adjust the display and functionality of the Amiga. We'll discuss using it a bit later. Finally, the clock icon is effectively the least important one, but it can be useful. By selecting it, you can see what time it is. You can move icons anywhere you'd like on the screen. Simply position the pointer over the icon, hold the right mouse button down, and drag the mouse to the position you want the icon to be in. For example, if you want to put a program into a drawer, drag it until the icon is positioned on top of the drawer and release the mouse button. As you become more familiar with the Amiga, you'll need to begin using the Windows often. In order to learn all about Windows, double-click the mouse on top of the disk icon in the upper right corner of the Amiga screen. The window includes the memory meter, a bar across the top called a drag bar, and some controls called gadgets. A gadget is like a switch. By selecting it, a specific function will occur. Once again, this is a good demonstration of the power of the workbench. The first gadget to learn about is the close gadget. On a window, you can find it in the upper left-hand corner. As its name suggests, the close gadget is used to close a window. Simply position the pointer over the close gadget and click the left button of the mouse once. Instantly, the window will disappear. To reopen the window, simply click on its originating icon, in this case, the disk icon. In the upper right-hand corner of the window is a pair of gadgets called the back and front gadgets. These are used to position the window in the screen. If you have more than one window open, things can get confusing, so to better control the windows, you can move them around using these gadgets. Notice that the title bar at the top of the screen also has a front and back gadget. These will be used if you are multitasking, and we'll explain a bit about that a little later. In the right hand and bottom margins of the window are the scroll bar gadgets. These allow you to move the contents of the window and resize the physical size of the windows themselves. One of the first things to learn about now that we have the basics of the screen under control is disks. These fellows are the critical link between your computer and your programs and information. If you lose the information on a disk, you'll need to reassemble the data from scratch. One of the wonderful things about computers is that you can copy almost anything from one disk to another. It's a good idea to copy certain disks before you use them. 
That way, should something unforetold occur, you'll have a spare or a backup available for keeping your project on schedule. FX is a sophisticated, full-featured image processing program. Modern image processing is the use of computer-based techniques to enhance and analyze two-dimensional images. In processing the image, the goal is to present the viewer with additional information or insight into factors that may not have been apparent in the unprocessed image. With its toolbox and palette and the scanner, render and printing modules, ImageFX delivers all the tools necessary for high-level image processing. The ImageFX interface or screen gadget is composed of five primary gadgets. The scanner, the palette, toolbox, here are the tool buttons, Render allows definition of screen and colors. And print, which sends the work away to your printer. Other controls are load, which brings up the usual file requester. Save, which gives alternative save formats. and the choice of how to save the picture. The press button brings up a gadget to enable you to customize the way the program will run to your own needs. So let's load our first image from the examples packaged with the program. The image loads as a black and white representation of the colour picture. The toolbox gadget can be sent away to view the complete picture. By selecting render and choosing the type of screen we want to use, in this case PAL high res interlaced with 16 colours, we can view the picture in colour. I've decided not to use the dither option for this picture. The progress of the render can be seen here on the status indicator. Incidentally, the program is seen here running on an Amiga 3000. Now, by selecting the toolbox and the filled rectangle tool, switching to palette and defining a red on the RGB sliders, We can draw a filled rectangle on the picture. Remember, the area here will appear in red when we render in colour. Choosing the scissors allows us to cut out and copy a section of the image, in this case the eye. 
We'll place our copy of the eye in the rectangle. Choosing render gives us the new image. And the changed picture appears with our rectangle and eye in position. Now we'll load another picture. And render it in color. This time I'll choose the toolbox again and the scissors. And this time we'll cut out the neck of the guitar. I'll place it on the Stonehenge column. This should give us an instrument for playing very, very heavy metal. Now a quick explanation of some of the other buttons. The sleep gadget places image effects in a sleep state, which the program temporarily quits. Double clicking on the image effects icon in Workbench reactivates the program. The about gadget displays memory and buffer status. This shows the image size, and this is the current file displayed. The color depth gadgets limit image processing and printing effects to the color selected. The three zooming gadgets allow magnification and reduction of image areas for fine, detailed work. The front gadget sends the image FX screen to the back. There are so many tools to choose from that it is impossible to cover them all here. Here's one, the rotate gadget. It rotates the image in the working display or the active brush. To close this section of the video, here's an example of morphing created with GBP Cinemorph and image FX. TypeSmith has been designed with powerful drawing capabilities for professional typeface designers. It has also been made simple to use so that casual users can easily modify existing typefaces. TypeSmith allows you to generate PostScript Type 1, PostScript Type 3, CompuGraphic IntelliFont and SoftLogic format fonts. With TypeSmith, you can create fonts for use with PageStream, Art Expression, Professional Page, Professional Draw, and any Workbench 2 compatible application. The main screen is a familiar arrangement of toolbox and pull down menus. Perhaps the easiest way to get started is to load in an existing font included in the TypeSmith program and take a brief look at some of the features. The letter chosen to view is simply typed in at the keyboard. Each letter has boxes called handles showing the different elements that go to make up each character. It is these handles that can be grabbed using the mouse to adjust the shape of the existing letters. An alternative way to view the letters is to pull down the character set overview window. 
All characters currently included in the current font are shown. Groups can be selected with the buttons, or by double-clicking on a particular letter it can be viewed full-size on the screen. This window can then be closed to go back to the original screen. Let's go back to the capital A. These tools can be selected to perform different operations on the letters. The display can be toggled between wireframe outline and solid for a different visual impression of the work in progress. By selecting a point on the letter and moving it, and another, the A can be adjusted. Let's take a look at that in solid mode. As well as loading the outline font, the metric file must also be opened to take full advantage of TypeSmith's features. This includes a preview box for viewing characters. When a character or symbol in the font is chosen, it's displayed in the preview box. The list can be scrolled to find a particular letter, the character width can be adjusted in the preview box or in the metrics box. Turning pairs can also be selected and adjusted so that when two letters are used together, they are spaced correctly. The spacing value can easily be changed. Now I'll adjust the next letter. This time I'm altering the curve at the top of the B. and now at the bottom. Now as a solid letter as it would print in a document. Now I'll load another demonstration font included in the program. This symbol is best viewed as an outline. Logos and short strings of letters can also be created and adjusted and saved as a single keystroke in the character set. The famous Commodore logo has been created. By selecting a group of elements and moving them, the logo can be changed. You can see how easy it is to create new typefaces and add logos to existing typefaces. The fonts are stored in a series of lines and curves segments. Straight lines are defined as two points and curves as four points. The first point, the last point, and two control points which define the shape of the curve. When beginning a font from scratch, you are asked by Typesmith to give it a name. An ID number as well as naming the weight, for instance, light or bold face. The screen has guidelines and a grid, which can be toggled on and off, and the snap to grid option allows you to draw and position elements with extreme accuracy. So here goes nothing my first attempt at a capital A. Okay, it's not so wonderful, but it's easy to improve and change at this stage 
And remember, if you'd rather adapt an existing font to your own style rather than starting from scratch, then Typesmith gives you that option too. You can even change, say, the width or overall height of a complete font at one go with the optional menus contained in the pull-down menus at the top of the screen. Smooth curves are easily attained also if your freehand style isn't too steady. Here I've loaded in a new font from a disc collection. Whilst we look at the W, I'll show how easy it is to import DR2D drawing and superimpose it on the existing font currently loaded. Interesting combinations and hybrid fonts can be created in this way. Another feature is the rotate operation, accessed from the pull-down menu. Or, let's try the scale paths feature to decrease the vertical height. Typesmith can be used without any difficulties on a minimum system configuration. With only 512k of chip RAM, you will however only be able to edit one or two characters at once. A minimum of one megabyte of chip RAM is therefore strongly recommended. Typesmith also features a type preview box to enable you to view sample strings of text. The text is entered at the keyboard and uses the font in its current form even after you may have modified it. Let's send the preview window away and change the letter P. This is a pretty drastic change, to put it mildly, but it shows up clearly on the preview screen when we re-enter the text. As I've changed the overall width of the letter, I'll change the metric width accordingly. Then I'll re-enter the text. Shortcut methods for producing letters can be achieved using the vertical and horizontal flip features. Here, a lowercase q is first flipped to make a d, and the result flipped to make the b. A capital L can be transformed with the minimum of work by copying and pasting the bottom bar. First one bar is copied. and the second one added. By deleting the bottom bar altogether, we make an F.
After a little practice, the at first somewhat daunting prospect of creating your very own typeface from scratch becomes easier and easier. Typesmith is a professional Amiga font editor. Altered or completely original fonts can be created and used in a variety of DTP packages with ease. This is desktop video. For many people, it's the renaissance of the video medium. Television is the most common form of communication today, and desktop video is making headlines around the world. The most exciting aspect of DTV is the merging of professional and amateur equipment and the ability for anyone with desire and creativity to access the world of television. This edition of desktop video will introduce you to a variety of equipment, techniques, and opportunities that will enhance your abilities to work in the world of video. When people discuss video, they often bring up tape formats. In the past, tape format was an important clue regarding the quality and style of a video production. If someone said they were producing a show on one inch, everyone knew it was professional. On the other hand, if they mentioned half inch, professionals assumed that it was an amateur show or just another home video. Today, almost everything you've heard about formats needs to be reevaluated. Of course, there are a few formats that are still considered top-of-the-line broadcast formats. These include D1, D2, D3, and 1-inch. These formats have tremendous costs associated with them, so only broadcast facilities currently utilize them. There are a number of other formats to consider. And these include Betacam SP, 3-quarter-inch SP, Hi8, Super VHS, DD Beta, VHS, and 8 millimeter. We decided to investigate tape format in order to learn about their strengths and weaknesses. We set up a photo shoot with a variety of cameras and recorders in order to capture a scene and compare the results. We recorded the same scene from the same location in order to make the comparison as accurate as possible. Further, each sequence once recorded was bumped onto Betacam SP so that the comparisons are made with a single generation loss. This sequence is Betacam SP. Most people are now using Betacam SP for professional and broadcast video production. This is 3 quarter inch SP. Typically, 3 quarter inch is used in electronic news gathering and education. It is also used for offline production work. This is high 8 footage, gathered with a 3 chip industrial camera. Hi8 began life as a consumer format, but is now finding a home in almost every form of professional video work as well. This footage is Hi8 shot with a consumer Sony camera. During the past few years, Hi8 has become the format of choice for serious home videographers. This is regular 8mm. This is the format of choice for price conscious or occasional home videographers. This is SVHS. Developed as a semi-pro format, it has fallen behind Hi8 in popularity, but is still used in cable and industrial applications as well as in consumer uses. Now, let's take a look at a direct comparison between formats. This is a Betacam SP image on the left. Now let's add a 3 quarter inch SP image on the right. Overall, they're similar but Betacam has better contrast and resolution. Now let's take a look at the same sequence with Betacam SP on the left and Hi8 on the right. Although there is a difference, it's amazing to note the overall quality of Hi8. Here are a few other variations. Take a look and judge for yourself. By the way, we didn't record in ED Beta or regular VHS, as those formats aren't widely used for most desktop video applications. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of this test can be traced back to the footage when viewed independently. Is this footage high 8? 
or maybe it's SVHS. Of course, it might be Betacam SP. The point we're making is that format is difficult to distinguish without direct comparison or a highly trained eye. In our experience, we found that Hi8 is an excellent medium that relates most closely to Betacam. Hi8 footage is showing up on CNN, in music videos, and in other broadcast applications. Hi8 has improved signal to noise ratios over other consumer and semi pro formats, and it utilizes an extremely high clip level, meaning that pictures are sharp and transfer to another reel of tape with good definition. Hyperbook provides a means to create interactive presentations to professional standard easily and flexibly. The simplest Hyperbook applications are just fancy pages that combine text and graphics. You might use the program to create Christmas and birthday cards, for example. Or, going one step further, you can store miscellaneous information on the pages of Hyperbook, locating the information you need using a built-in table of contents and search facilities in the program. Moving on from there, you can add buttons that turn to other pages, show pictures or text, or other actions. To give you a taste of Hyperbook, let's run the demo that comes complete with the program. The interface is a familiar toolbox and pull-down menu arrangement, so there is nothing complicated to learn before we can run the demo. The file requester is standard, and so choosing directories and files is easy. The first page pops up. Notice how the toolbox has flipped small to the top of the screen so that pages can be viewed. This bar can be clicked to read more about the program. Text is shown, and by using the scroll bar at the side, you can view more. Through reading it, we can click the close gadget to return to the first page. By clicking this bar, we can view some pictures. This area, by clicking, will give us more information. Clicking the hand carries us on. Here a range of interactive objects can be selected. Drawings. These can be created using the tools in Hyperbook. Or we could select text. This can be slanted, coloured, even overlapped. Lists can be scrolled, and choosing an item in the list could take us to another page. Within that page we can have a further list. Clicking on these could take us to yet more pages. Perhaps the most impressive feature is the ability to show pictures. At any time it is possible to bring the toolbox back to full size for further work or editing. The different tools are selected by clicking the mouse. Let's clear the current Hyperbook and do a bit of creative work. We'll select a text tool and define the size of the text area. 
a flashing cursor within the box shows that we may enter text at the keyboard. Two buttons at the top of the screen, text control and spacing, can be selected to provide further control at this stage. In the text control box we can choose color, style, text position on the page, left, centered, right or justified, and the position of the text within the box can be adjusted. Fonts are included in the Hyperbook disk, but additional fonts can be loaded from Workbench. Now I'm entering text at the keyboard. I highlight the text. And once highlighted, I can change the font style. By loading alternative fonts from Workbench, choosing the size, seeing what it looks like, and my line has changed to the new font. The spacing of the line can also be changed. Highlight the line and then use the slider in the spacing control. Now we've seen a glimpse of some of the features, let's load another previously prepared hyperbook. To give you an idea of how easy the program is to use, this current book took me just 30 minutes to prepare for this video. The first page has a welcome message and a world map with red buttons to choose and click with the mouse. Picking one selects another page in the book which gives the name of the country or continent. Pressing the button indicated by the pointing hand returns us to page one again. At the bottom of the page an alternative bar gives us the option to see pictures. The sky background for this page was loaded from a clip art library disc collection. Everything else was created in Hyperbook. The buttons can be pressed to view the pictures. The pictures themselves are imported from pre-scanned images prepared in a variety of graphics manipulation packages such as Art Department Professional, Image Master and others. Pictures can be displayed in a variety of all the usual screen formats HAM, high res, low res etc. Most of the buttons on this page are actually small sections from the full-size pictures themselves. The swim button is slightly different in that it displays a further intermediate screen inviting you to click to swim. Clicking the button brings us the picture. Clip art can also be viewed and logos. When we are through playing the page we can quit back to the first page. Here are some more ideas for using Hyperbook. How about a personal address book with lots of extra information, even photos of the people in it? An appointment calendar, diary, quick reference book, database for record or stamp collection. How about a family tree, again with photos? Hyperbook is ideal for business or educational presentations because it is interactive and can be designed to suit different approaches by users requiring different information. Into the realm of games, Hyperbook can give us interactive fiction, different plots and ways to read the book depending on the reader's own decisions. In fact, Hyperbook has so many potential uses 
that it's impossible to mention them all here. This is one of those programs that is linked to your own imagination. Music and media requires imagination, so let's take a look at this clip from the video of that name. Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Since its introduction, the MIDI standard has evolved from a simple multi-synth control code to a widely used sequencing and control system for a variety of applications. A MIDI program is in many ways like a computer program, although more flexible and easily modifiable. A MIDI program, called a patch, could send a simple message, such as play middle C, or it could send a complex set of instructions for a variety of instruments, sound variables, and volume control. When MIDI first came onto the scene, uh, at first, um, I, I was very inquisitive, like, what is this? And then uh, after, after that, I saw it used, I saw devices hooked up with it, and uh, even though I didn't fully understand it at the time, uh, I thought, hey, this is something that uh, can be extremely useful. You know, now we're beginning to be able to communicate uh, from device to device by different manufacturers without all these uh, little black boxes and patch cords that either worked or didn't. And, uh, you know, to me, it was just a wonderful thing. MIDI data consists of bits, exactly like much of the other data that computers share. A bit can be either a one or a zero. Sending complex messages consists of combining those ones and zeros into a meaningful string. Many bits are combined into eight-bit strings or eight-bit words. MIDI requires an additional bit at the beginning of a word that says go, and a final bit at the end of a word that tells the receiving device that the word is over. So MIDI information is made up of 10-bit words. All right, uh, this particular MIDI device here has uh, your standard MIDI connections in, through, and out. Uh, now the MIDI in is uh, simply a uh, uh, plug that allows you to play your synthesizer directly into the computer. Uh, it allows the computer to actually take the information in from the synthesizer. The MIDI out is the, the reverse of that. It allows the uh, information that's been stored on the computer to now go back out and play the synthesizer. Now the MIDI through, which is the third plug, uh, all that does is allow information pl being played from this synthesizer to come in through this uh, plug and come directly out of this plug, say, to play another synthesizer. Uh, it can be stored in the computer at the same time. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but it comes through this port, just as the term uh, denotes, through to another port without uh, being altered in, in any manner. This has been just a taste of Amiga applications and is intended to provide inspiration for those of you devoted to the Amiga. We hope this tape helps you to use your Amiga to its full potential. Remember, for actual how-to advice and instruction on particular aspects, the Amiga Video Collection Library of Tapes is available, all reasonably priced and crammed with tips from the professionals, all those tricks of the trade that are not to be found in the manual. Contact us at this address or phone our 24-hour hotline. The Amiga Video Collection, an invaluable instructional and informative collection of videos made by Amiga users for Amiga users.